Welcome back, everyone. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. Yes, we do. If you are interested in just listening in today, we do have our podcast available, and please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, if you or someone you know is from a polygamous background and would like to share your story with the world, please feel free to reach out at growingupinpolygamy at gmail.com. We also have our holiday fundraiser going on right now. You can click the link below to donate. And we are trying to adopt a room at the Dream Center, which is a place in Short Creek. Uh, it used to be Warren Jeff's old home and has now been turned into a place, a safe haven for people who are leaving polygamous communities, a place for them to live and get resources. So if you'd like to donate to the cause of adopting a room and renovating one for their use, then please click that link below. And thank you all so much for those of you that have donated already. We're very grateful for your donation. Yes, we are so excited for this video um, for a couple of reasons that we're going to give some spoilers to. But one reason we've had lots of people reach out to us and say, hey, Peter Santanello is making these videos all about Utah and Mormonism and a couple things. One is we kind of knew about this ahead of time because Sam and I are in one of his future upcoming videos. Yes. Talking about Short Creek. Yes. We loved hanging out with him for a day and he met us out there in Short Creek, my hometown. And we actually did a tour of the place and talked about you know, what it was like living there as he was showing visual of it. So it was very cool. He had a lot of great questions. We had a great time with him. So uh, we're looking forward for that one coming out as well. But for now, we're excited to see that he has been meeting with a lot of other people in Utah. And we've had some requests that we actually respond or react to some of these videos that he's already had come out. Yeah, we, we started watching a little bit and then we turned off and we're like, no, let's leave our reactions <laughs> for the video. But two things to know kind of going into this. One, Peter's just super cool guy. So cool, yes, so respectful, so kind, like about the communities, at least in our experience. And then on these videos, we could already tell. So it's just super cool guy. Secondly, when we're reacting to this, nothing that we say is ever meant against the people that he's interviewing, okay? It's right. not like we're not going to be trying to bash on their the things that they say or their version of things. We just want to react and kind of compare what they're growing up in the LDS religion, what mine was, and kind of compare and contrast there a little bit. Also, some of the stuff they say, they talk about polygamy a little bit. Yep. They may talk about the fundamentalists. And so I think a lot of our viewers were wanting to see your reaction. So what they think about the FLDS yes. or possibly what they do or do not know about the FLDS. So very interested to get into this. I also sp uh, was active in the LDS church for many years. And so it's very, I'm interested to see some of these people talk about a mission and what all of that means as well. So uh, we're looking forward to get into this. This is a pretty long video, about an hour and 15 minutes-ish. So um, we're going to react to the whole thing. We may cut out parts and maybe just show our reactions to certain pieces. Depending on how this video goes, we'll see how much we're gonna be reacting to, but we're not gonna make you watch like long stretches without any reactions from us. So just kind of a heads up as far as that goes. Yeah. This is one of the more famous overlooks of the city. So Brigham Young came here and said, this is the place. Yes, yeah. So for most of the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we've been on the move. We started in New York with Joseph Smith. Um, when he received what we like to call the first vision, he uh, received a vision from God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. Yep. And was told that none of the churches or Christian churches on the earth at the current time had the full grasp or the full doctrine okay. um, that the true Church of Jesus Christ needed. And so Joseph Smith was um, commanded that at a later time, he'd be the one to, to restore this church back to the earth. And that's what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is today. And um, we settled in Ohio for a little while. We got kicked out, uprooted from there. We settled in Missouri for a while. We were also uprooted from there. There was a extermination order from the governor of Missouri who said, you know, if it's legal to kill Mormons, to get them out of the state, to drive them from the state. And so we were driven from Missouri, Okay. went to Illinois, we were driven out from there, and eventually we settled here in the valley of the Great Salt Lake. And that's 
Brigham Young saying this is the place. 1850 something? 1847. 1847. And so this was just desert? This was all just desert. There were native people here. But other than that, it was not occupied by anybody else. It was part of Mexico at the time. And so the saints had left the United States, come to Mexico in hopes that they could finally settle down and practice the religion in a place that was uh, free from outside influences. And we were able to do that. And as you can see, this beautiful city, it's the, um, the sacrifice of the pioneers who came all the way across the country on foot. You were saying a lot of people right now, whenever a camera comes out around Mormons, they're gonna put them under the bus for the most part. Is that how you feel? Yeah, so I go to BYU, that's, that's the college I go to, and right now there's kind of a TikTok trend of people going up to BYU students and asking them questions about the church and trying to catch them off guard and make them look like they're, they're silly or they're, um, they're peculiar. I mean, obviously our beliefs are peculiar, but that doesn't mean they're not valid. And I think that's kind of a sad thing that you see nowadays is that people are trying really hard to make members of the church look like their beliefs aren't valid and that okay. they, yeah, they're not allowed to believe a certain way. I was always raised that we were supposed to be a peculiar people. Right, and be proud of it, right? And be very proud of it. Also, first impression, I just have to say that he's very well-spoken, has his history correct so far. I didn't catch his name, but um, he, yeah, it's true. Like the extermination order, on the Mormons and them being able, that extermination order, they didn't like actually retract it until like not that long ago. <laughs> like in right. the late 1900s is when they finally, obviously they weren't still killing Mormons, but like for them to officially like take away the order. So yeah. pretty intense stuff to get to Utah. There's a lot of persecution and hate, right? But the people of the church would actually use that persecution as a faith building thing for them as showing that, well, we were told that that uh, the people of the world would fight against Christ's church, that they would fight against the people of the Lord. So they would use that persecution as faith building for their members and as they moved around to different places. And I would say that that still is true. Like mm -hmm. when he's talking about TikToker, TikTokers coming up and you know, trying to make people look silly or foolish or all these type of things. In the church's mind, it's still like we're meant to be a peculiar people and people are going to persecute the Lord's church. Like if Jesus Christ himself was persecuted and crucified, then wouldn't his church also be persecuted and right. looked at and mocked right. in certain ways? So I think that's still something within the church today that anytime people look down upon or try to invalidate the LDS church, the members say, this is proof that we are doing the Lord's work. Right. And it can be tricky, though, you know, because in certain circumstances, like with the FLDS, growing up there, when Warren Jeffs is imprisoned or caught for something, doing doing something really badly, and is in prison, in prison for it, his followers also will say, see, they're putting the Lord's prophet in prison. So, you know, it can go in all extreme. sorts of different directions and to extremes that mindset so it's just something to be i guess thoughtful of is it because you you said earlier it's a high demand religion yes. meaning there's a there's a lot you're responsible for yeah one of our prophets um two prophets ago president um, uh -huh. gordon b hinckley he was interviewed by uh, 60 minutes at one point by mike wallace and he asked that exact question like hey you guys are a, a high demand religion and President Hinckley, he responded, it's a beautiful thing. Not a lot of religions nowadays demand a lot of their members and demand them to try to improve the world, to improve themselves. It's one of my favorite parts is that it does demand a lot of me and it demands that I become a better person and I strive to make the world a better place. Sorry, I had to make a quick comment here too yeah. that um, when they say, we always refer to them as high demand religions. A lot of people use the word cults. We don't really use that word on our channel. And I would say the main reason for that is as he's saying here, like high demand, if you're highly demanded to do good, then they would consider it a religion, right? right? And obviously the FLDS, they had demanded a lot more, but still in the eyes of the people, they were being highly demanded to do the Lord's work. And that's where it gets tricky, right? So when he was saying, I love being in the high demand religion, like why wouldn't we expect a lot of ourselves and expect um, to do the Lord's work and that that's gonna be 
demanding and that that's going to be a lot of work to do good and make the world a better place. I always viewed that as a positive as well, being raised in the yeah. LDS church. And I think, again, people will look at all the rules. Oh, there's so many rules. That makes it a cult. And I'm like, I don't think so um, personally. You know, and there's there's different. Everyone has a different idea of what a cult is. Mm -hmm. But like he said, I thought he said it really well. And that's the same way that I viewed it growing up, that it's a high demand for good. Right. From the outside looking in, you would say, wow, that's a lot of rules. Why would you belong to something that requires so much of you, that is taking so much of your time and effort and money, and, and, money everything. And, and everything? Why would you belong to something like that? Doesn't that seem a little cultish, right? Those are some of the comments that people get. But when you're in the inside, and you can speak for this, and I can as well, that, that like he said, when there's so much of your life is consumed in in doing things with and for the church, you look at that as a positive thing. You look at it as, I'm here serving the Lord. I'm doing what he wants me to do. I'm focusing all my time and attention on that. I'm not focusing on worldly things. I'm focusing on spiritual things. So they take it as a very positive thing. Absolutely. Right, so by having those frameworks to work within and in the discipline that it takes to live like that, you feel like it's a net benefit but there's got to be some cons to it, right? Or yeah. So I mean, the um, the average college student experience is you know going to parties, okay. drinking, experimenting with different substances, and that's something that I, I miss out on if I um, if I feel that, you know. Obviously, I was raised in the church, and so I've never really had a desire to to do those things. Okay. Someone from the outside would be like, "Oh, you know, this this Brock guy, he's missing out on um, lots of college experiences that the average person would would get." Tea, coffee, no. Yeah. Alcohol, no. Yeah. Another aspect that people kind of overlook: it's not just all don'ts; it's also do's. We encourage a very healthy lifestyle. In Utah, that's very easy with the beautiful mountains. So, is that why Salt Lake City is so nice, as far as it's very clean? Compared to other American cities at this moment in time, it seems like it's better off. Is it because of the Mormon element, would you say, because there is all that discipline and order? Or, or what explains it? Yeah, I, I think um, people who are in the church, who are raised in the church, you know, you, you grew up with a lot of discipline. And even if you decide to, to leave the church and okay. don't participate anymore, you still have those values as the basis of your life. And you grew up in a household where education was important, um, taking care of your family. All of these um, beautiful family values you learn in the church are still established in your life, even if you decide to leave. And so Salt Lake and the whole Utah area is beautiful. And um, in my opinion, it's a divine place because of people who are willing to, um, to live a disciplined lifestyle. Okay. I think that's really cool of Brock to mention the fact that people who leave can still have all those values. Mm -hmm. I think maybe even, not even that long ago, 10, 20 years ago, like when I was growing up, if people left the church, it was very much like, oh, they were going to sin and do these horrible things, you know? And I feel like that the more people that have left and kept those family values, like he said, I would consider us in that category. Like he said, our core family values and discipline and the things that we learned, like I will never, ever, ever regret being raised in the Mormon church. Like I loved it. It was so good for me. It was so good for us and our values and creating yeah. our family the way that it happened and everything like that. And so I think it's really cool of him to mention that and say that even people who leave hold on to those values and can be you know, positive members of society through those same things. Right. And some people might ask you, or maybe they're thinking right now, well, why wouldn't you regret some of the things that your, the church forced you to do or forced you to believe and things like that? But there, there are two different ways to go about that. People can, can leave something behind and focus on all of the negative that was forced on them, or they can leave something behind and take the positive with them. And, you know, in some cases, you know, some people experience some bad, very bad experiences. Unfortunately, you hear about that on the news now. Some people from the FLDS or the LDS mainstream Mormon church. And you hear about some of these stories, but in our case, thankfully, most of it was positive and we're able to take that and be grateful for the way that we were raised and then, in, you know, instill that into our family as well. The good, the good that we learned. Yeah. And I feel like it's the same with you leaving the FLDS, right? Mm -hmm. Like there were so many good family values and luckily he didn't have the abuse and the things that, you know, other people's stories that we even help share 
about the FLDS and the abuses and the things that happen yeah. within the church. It's not that those don't exist and that those were horrible experiences for other people, but Sam didn't personally experience that. Right. So he can look back on his childhood and say, I had a net positive experience and I can take things that I learned from there and implement right. it. And that's exactly how I felt in the LDS. I didn't have horrific experiences or some of the experiences that some other people might have. And I had a net positive, very positive experience. And so I can take those same values and bring them into into my household and yeah so it's it's good to i feel like be positive where positivities do right doing some research though i did see your crime rates have gone up a lot it's actually not crime rates per 100,000 and that can break down into homicide uh, larceny petty theft stuff but the overall is pretty high right now would you attribute that to what would you say there's a variety of factors. In 2002, Utah hosted the Olympics, um, the Winter Olympics, and before that time, Utah was generally pretty unknown among the American populace. And so when people saw how amazing Utah was during the Olympics, tons of people started moving here who didn't have those shared values that a lot of people in Utah had. And so over time, there's been kind of an eroding of the values of, um, of the church and, and the community. Interesting points here. Uh, well, first of all, I don't think it's fair for him to blame the outsiders moving in for crime rates to go up. You know, I'm sure there are people that are local from Utah that are a part of these crimes as well, right? I don't think you can blame everyone else for the problems, right? Yeah, but, so I don't know though. Growing up LDS in Utah, I'm like that's how it felt. <laughs> So I don't know. I'm with I'm, Well, I mean, maybe to I, some extent, I understand. You, you know, you can't just say randomly, no, it's because of the outsiders coming in there. It's their fault. Um, but I mean, I'm not saying he's completely wrong. It just seems a little bit of a blanket statement like, oh, it's all, <laughs> all of them. Secondly, the fun, the funny thing or not funny, but something interesting that he pointed out with the, the Winter Olympics that they held in Utah in Salt Lake that was actually the time that all of the FLDS people that were living in Salt Lake, there was quite a large population of FLDS people living in Salt Lake at that time. The winter of 2002, where that's where the FLDS leader said everyone living there has to be out of Salt Lake area before the Olympics. Because of all the evil people living in, babe. So it's just interesting to see. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah, but it's interesting to see that both of them, like the FLDS, and it sounds like he's kind of blaming the Olympics for certain things here, which is just very interesting. I'd never heard anyone from the LDS church uh, say anything negatively towards the Olympics coming to Salt Lake. That's the first time I've heard that. Just that it brought outsiders. But we we all know how well closed off communities end up working out in long term. So. Right. <laughs> And that's, uh, that's just one aspect of it, of a religious aspect. Politically, there definitely has been a change in the guard of um, what political parties are in control of Salt Lake City. So I would say that most LDS members would also say that the political changes also matches that of those who come in. So in the LDS church, you don't have to belong to a particular political party. Like they never say, okay, you have to be Republican, you have to be Democrat or whatever. Right. It's never like that. But Utah has always been a very red state mm -hmm. and a lot of the values that the church holds tends to align with that. There's even times where the church puts money towards certain political things. I know they did in California, you know, money towards political campaigns or certain aspects that go against church values. So when he says, oh, you know, that's the religious aspect. And then there's the political. I'm like, the political and the religious within Utah is very closely tied because of a lot of the values tend to lean one way. And so when he's saying other political thoughts or values are coming right. into the state, I'm like, it's the same as saying the outsiders are. Exactly. But also what he might be considering good values to someone else could be not so great values, right? Yeah. Everyone has their different opinions. I know of some people that moved to Utah and lived there for a couple of months and said, um, no, I'm not doing this. And they left because it just didn't align with their values and what they thought was good for the people. So like you say, if you're, in, if you're in the belief system that's already there, then you're going to think that what's there is the best. And when outsiders come in and try to change that, then it's bad. But from the outside perspective, maybe it's not all bad, the changes that are being made. That's a very good point.
So a lot of people would attribute certain changes to political party changes. Okay. Um, but yeah, there has been an uptick, and that's just because Utah, it's one of the fastest growing states, and that brings a lot of change. So is that a threat to the Mormons that have been here forever? Multi-generational Mormons, do they feel like that is a threat, all these people moving in? Peter asked the best question, so I just people, love um, Some people would say that. Um, okay. Most members of the church used to live downtown Salt Lake in, um, in a neighborhood called the Avenues. With all this change, there's been kind of an urban flight away from downtown. And people who weren't raised in the church so have kind pretty. of taken over the downtown Salt Lake City area and live in these, um, in this, all these pioneer homes, original pioneer settlements where... These are original pioneer homes here? Yes, this is right just directly north of Temple Square. And so yeah, oh, some of these are beautiful. Gonna be, yeah, they're obviously renovated, but... It's really a beautiful city. Those homes, if you ever have a chance and you are in Salt Lake to go roam around the homes north of Temple Square, absolutely mm. gorgeous yeah. homes. It's just stunning. So beautiful. Peter captures some of the best landscapes and things. This is just stunning. It is, yeah. And with the mountains kicking up right out of it. So this building right here is the church. Yeah, this is the office building. You have tons of different offices for accounting, for missionary departments, family departments. So what's the church offering? It seems like a big apparatus there. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's a worldwide organization and um, finances, welfare, temples. We're building temples all over the world. We're building new meeting houses. There's a lot that goes in on church headquarters. Over here on the right, this is the church history library. There's a project that started a couple years ago called the Joseph Smith Papers, and it's one of the largest public histories of primary source documents anywhere in the world. This is your um, conference center. Yeah, this is where all of our major conferences happen. We've where been there. Prophets yeah. and apostles speak to us, and it's it's a massive building. So by being a member to the church, do you have to pay in a certain amount every year? Like, what funds all of this? Yeah, so we, um, we believe in the law of the tithe, and members of the church donate 10% of their, um, their income to to the church. You do that? I do that, yeah. Even as a college student, the church doesn't necessarily need the funds to run anymore, but we still believe that's something kind of like with coffee. It's not something that maybe makes sense on a secular level or, you know, with study, but it is something that we do and we believe that blesses us as we, uh, as we participate in that. Okay. I have to say the fact that Brock like acknowledges the fact that the church doesn't need that money anymore. Again, I think Peter found a really good um, representative of the church and being mm -hmm. willing to be open and transparent about that. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's been controversy and stuff about tithing money. And like he said, I feel like as long as members are giving, recognizing that it's for that it's not because the church needs it, but that it's just a law within themselves, that it's not secular anymore. I feel like going into it with that knowledge is the best way. Um, I can't say everybody's done that in the past. At least I didn't. I felt like it was very much more of like a spiritual requirement. Right. Yeah, definitely. It, um, and, and they do believe that if they pay this money, like he mentioned, even though I'm a college student and I'm not making a lot of money, I'm still giving 10%. Someone might ask, why in the world would you do that? That's not very financially savvy. Well, they're taught, we were taught, that if you do, that you will be blessed financially, physically, you know, temp yeah. temporally on this earth because you're showing that I have faith in you, God, that you will bless me if I show that I am being a worthy, uh, trusting, and God-fearing person, that I will be blessed. So that's... You know, they definitely are hoping and expecting blessings in return by showing their faithfulness. Oh, yeah. I grew up with, you know, most people around me saying, like, I can't afford to not pay my tithing. Mm -hmm. The idea that if you did not pay your tithing, you wouldn't be able to be financially successful or financially secure. And then the church welfare system, you know, they do say, like, pay your tithing first. And then if you do need food or those type of things, then the church will help. But your tithing is supposed to always come first. But right. I just thought that was cool of him to actually acknowledge, like, for a while, for a long time, the church did need the money mm -hmm. for everything. And at this point, there's so many billions of dollars that they don't really need it anymore. So it's supposed to be only a spiritual principle at this point. Is that accurate? No, it's just, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, well, what do they do with the money then, right? <laughs> well, that's not really the point of this video, but, but we understand your questions. Yes. Leave them in the comments, and if there's anything that we can try to answer in the comments, then we'll try to get to that.
Okay, so someone in their career here will pay federal, state tax, and then also, I don't know if you call it LDS tax or what you call it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we don't necessarily, you know, look at it as like, a, okay. I think most people look at taxes as a negative. We look at tithing look at as, a, as a positive. Uh -huh. And the church gorgeous. handles its money very effectively. Okay. You're not having to worry about, oh, I'm spending money and one of the apostles is funding some trip to, you know, Mexico to go on a vacation with his family. It's the money um, that is spent to the church goes towards, first of all, all the different things that the church is building. Right now, obviously, you can see the, our historic Salt Lake Temple is under renovation. Um, funds go to things like that. They go to the church's universities. The church invests a lot of its tithing money, so that way in the future, if there are times when um, the world economy has crashed or this and that, they can still run church finances, can still bless the lives of church members, even if there isn't um, opportunities for growth financially in the world. But so. by being part of the church, what do you receive financially from the church like they're not going to pay your health care or anything like that right or i mean so if <laughs> it's a great question the church has a very um a very deep welfare system where okay. if you are struggling financially you can go to um, your local and we call them bishops the local um i guess for other religions would be like a pastor or their leader you can receive financial assistance from the church so you can continue to you know live a lifestyle um, of getting back on your feet but also um, the church's universities, that's a huge thing that most members of the church who attend university at, and through the church's educational system don't go into debt for college, which is huge in today's world when you're striving to get on your feet, I guess. So you don't go into debt at all with your college? Some people might if they, they don't have, I had money saved up, but the tuition is extremely cheap, especially for private Christian universities. We don't. Just to kind of, my quick comment about this, I should probably stop calling them quick comments. My comment on this, <laughs> when Peter asked, what do you receive in return for your tithing? Really, you're only receiving church, built like access to church buildings and access to temples, which is huge. And so, you know, as Brock's pointing out, there is welfare systems and things that we do to help the, the poor and the needy and people who do need assistance. The majority of members, especially living in the US, are never gonna need that assistance. So that's not really for the average church member. It's not gonna be for most people. Your your tithing, you understand, is mostly going to your church buildings. It's going to temple building so that you can enjoy temples because it doesn't cost you anything to go and do temple mm -hmm. sessions. It does pay for, and I know I didn't mention it when he says, you know, people can't go on, they're not going and doing lavish vacations, but they do pay, you know, once you get to a certain calling and higher, they do. When it's their, full time. Once it's a full time job, well, a lot of times it can be a full time job before you even get paid as a bishop, the it yeah. could be a full time job. But all the higher church leaders that it is their full time job, um, they're all getting paid very nice salaries. And, but in a way, so they, they could definitely take their family on vacation. So it's not that you're not funding that. They get their salaries, they're getting, you know, housing, they're getting certain things taken care of for them. So, but I'd say the average member is more doing tithing for the spiritual blessings and the access to the temple, right. I'd say is why for they're sure. doing it. Because I brought it up, I just need to clarify, most local leaders like the bishop and the state presidents and all of them, and they do have other full-time jobs. Yeah, they so do not get paid. They're not getting paid for their service. They do, do it willingly. Uh, do you remember what level it is? I want to say it's like area 70 or above. It's very high church leadership. Right. Most All local leadership is all volunteer. Nobody gets paid for right. that. Even stake presidents, if, if I understand correctly, yeah, they most of the either. time they have saved up and they're financially stable before they ever go and uh, do anything like a mission president. Because mission presidents, I believe it's three years they spend away from home on in the mission field, and they're in charge of a large group of of missionaries. And they don't get paid either. Uh, not that I know of. Now, most most adults, I mean, if they're going and serving missions as an adult, they pay for that out of their right. own pockets. So they're not getting paid. Yep. So yeah, a lot and a lot of the church leaders have been very successful businessmen. The current prophet was an open heart surgeon, like. Mm -hmm. Um, world-renowned right. open-heart surgeon. So a lot of the church leaders are very successful in their own yeah. right before they have these higher callings anyway, but there is a salary and that goes to that as well. Yeah. The West obviously is known for its earthquakes. And so there's a great fear that if there was a big earthquake, there'd be a lot of damage to the temple. They're placing <clears throat> base isolators under the temple. So that way, if an earthquake happens, 
the temple can move with the earth. We haven't gotten to see this construction. So mm -mm. beautiful. Just Crazy. about six years after the saints came into the valley, it was a huge priority to build temples. And so there's a few, uh, we call these pioneer era temples. There's one down in a place called Manti, another in St. George, and another in Logan, where they're the, these original, very castle looking, original pioneer temples. 16.5 million Mormons in the world, correct? Yeah, so th this, um, this last conference, we just got above 17 million. And over half of that is outside the United States. So the stereotype is obviously somebody who looks like me with blonde hair, blue eyes, and is white. <laughs> right. But for the most part, most members of the church now are not, you know, white Utahns. They're mostly people from around the world who uh, resonate with the message of the restored gospel. We believe a, a sign of a true church is that some, it's a church that strives to grow and strives to spread throughout the whole world and have people actually hear its message. So that answers. That's interesting that he brings that up, uh, the temples as well. In the FLDS church, people ask me all the time, well, didn't the FLDS church try to grow their church? Didn't they have temples as well? Well, they didn't for a long time, but Warren Jeffs, before he was imprisoned, he did make the temple there in Texas, and they were starting to do what they considered temple work, which I'm sure was similar in some ways, but very different in other ways from the mainstream LDS church. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about, in the FLDS, they were talking about the church would grow in the last days, that, Savior, that the Savior would return, there would, he would come again to the earth, and at that time, there would be a time of peace, and the word of God would spread throughout the earth. So they, they claimed it was going to happen, but at a later date. Yeah, just different timelines. And Warren Jeffs was claiming that because of the building of the temple in Texas, the time was coming very soon, that the last days were here, and that that would start, that the Savior would come, the wicked would be destroyed, and that the, the spreading of the gospel would come at that time. But as you can see, the LDS Church has for a very long time been spreading the word throughout the world, building temples all over the world. So in that aspect, very different. Yeah, and Joseph Smith sent out missionaries from the very yep. early conception of the church. So the LDS basically just continued that portion of, of spreading the word and believing that the word had... I was taught that the word had to be spread across the entire earth before the second coming could happen. Mm -hmm. So basically everyone had to have an opportunity to hear it all over the world before Christ even could come. So just different timelines there, but obviously both still believe that it has to happen. It's just when right. it happens. Yep. Here's my next question. Why do you proselytize? Like what, why do you want to convince other people to believe in your ways? Well, first off it's um, doctrinally accurate. Christ taught his apostles that they needed to spread and fill the whole world with the gospel. And so we believe that by doing missionary work, we're spreading the true church. Um, also, another aspect is, you know, when I was graduating high school and I'd grown up in the church, I was blessed with so much. I want to share that with other people. That's a huge motivation for missionary work as well, is that we believe that we've been blessed with so much. We need to go out and help the world and uh, spread the gospel okay. of Jesus Christ to as many people as we can. So. That's definitely a huge factor of it that I think sometimes people don't realize is like when you've been raised in it, you're so, you think that you have like not only all the truth that you want to share truth, but like just your happiness and your joy that you feel within your religion. That's really the main motivation I think that most people have when they serve missions is the happiness that you receive. Was that how it was for you? Yes. I do have to admit though that a lot of the need to, to serve a mission is because the leaders of the church are asking you to. They're telling you that they're telling you it's what God wants. That even the sharing the, the gospel with other people, it's not only missions, just your everyday members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints may approach you on the street, even if they're not technically serving a full-time mission or, or, you know, I don't know, invite you over to this for a true. family home evening or something because they're taught and they do believe that not only do they want to share the joy that they have, but they feel it is their duty to share the gospel to all of the earth. That's this kind of a, a need. They feel like they need to do that. That's a good point. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's also, I mean, there was definitely prophets who said, like, every worthy man should serve a mission, right? Like, it mm -hmm. wasn't uh, whether, oh, should I, should it's, I not? It's definitely, a, it's, it's a duty now. It's a, this is, this needs to be done. This is what God wants. This is what he is requiring of his, of his faithful followers. It's true.
So if somebody doesn't believe, believe in LDS, they're not Mormon, do you feel like they just don't know yet? They just haven't come around, they haven't figured it out yet, they haven't been introduced to it the right way? Or yes. <laughs> what are your thoughts about that? Say a guy like me, like, yeah. I'm not Mormon. Do you feel like, oh, Peter's just missing out on something or? No, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't condemn anybody with how they were raised or how they believe, they choose to believe. We just, um, we only invite. And if people don't necessarily come to that conclusion to join the church in this life, um, we believe that God still has a plan for them in the next life. A common question in Christianity is what happens to people in authoritarian states like North Korea where they have no access okay. to, to religion. And in our church, we have that answer in that in the next life, they can still be taught. Along those lines, though, we are very much taught that, like, this opportunity that Brock has to share this with Peter, right, is planting seeds. We are very much taught all the time that to plant seeds in people's lives, right? Like, this is maybe this is Peter's first interaction with a Mormon, right? And Brock is planting that first seed. Well, then the next person he meets that's Mormon could be the water, and the next person could be the sunlight. And we were very much taught all growing up in the church to always be kind, put your best foot forward and have opportunities to share because you never know when that next opportunity is gonna come where if enough people reach out to him, then he's gonna feel the spirit and realize that there's something to the church and investigate it more. So it's very much the idea that you can always make a positive influence and they'll come around. And as Brock says, if you don't come around in this life, you still have to come around in the next life in order to be able to make it to the highest degree of glory and be in the celestial kingdom and live in the presence of God in the next life. So when they say like in the next life, they can still be taught. I think now sometimes people will be like, what if like, I don't ever want to be Mormon? <laughs> We're like, well, trust me, that's not what you really want in the next life. So you, you, you know, but if you don't do it in this next, in this life, you can do it in the next. Right. Which is, you know, it, it's tricky. That's a tri tricky topic because then seem, some people will ask, well, why don't I just live my life how I want here? And then uh, in the next life, I can convert and the, everything will be well, right? Because then you won't there, have all the blessings of the church and exactly. the gospel in your life now. And that's what that would be the answer is, well, if you join now, then you could be blessed in this life as well as the next life. So anyway. They definitely still, we want to teach everybody. Right. Have you ever been tempted to leave the church or it's always been very clear and like certain where you're at? For me, I've never had the temptation to leave okay. the church. Um, obviously, I've questioned certain beliefs. There's a lot of very um, icky history. I wanted to be a history teacher and so okay. I studied a lot of that. <laughs> sure. And it doesn't look good. And a lot of people will take this history and say, hey, I can't be a member of the church anymore because this one prophet or this one apostle did a certain thing. Okay. And that's really okay. tragic because at the end of the day, the most important part of being a member of this church is that connection to Christ. The prophet obviously helps facilitate that, but they can make mistakes. The, the apostles in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they made lots of mistakes, okay. and the Lord rebuked them for that. Okay. And so in this icky history, it might be a temptation to say, okay, this person's done something wrong, I'm going to leave. But at the end of the day, the most important part is that connection to Jesus Christ. So two things here. One... Good job, Brock, for admitting and acknowledging that there's icky history. Right. To say there w wasn't anything icky, that would be Not definitely true. raising some concern. Yes. Yeah. So glad he acknowledged it. Secondly, the reason, another reason just for viewers in general, why the icky history can be hard for people in the church, and it was for me, is when he says that, you know, they can make mistakes and they have these problems and they can be just a man. That is true, like in their own personal life. But there is a lot of church teachings, especially from Joseph Smith himself, that says that when they're teaching over the pulpit, when they're teaching directly and they say that it's revelation from God, that they cannot be wrong or else they would cease to be the prophet. The God would literally like take mm -hmm. them away from that. So the things that were icky within church history that I personally made me go, ugh, um, weren't things that these men were doing on their own time in their own situations. It was the things that they were saying over the pulpit that they were claiming were revelation from God. Right. And so I think that's one distinction that a lot of people who are have problems or they do leave because of the history. It's not because he's a man over here. It's from what he said was revelation from God. And you have to decide whether or not you believe that the God you believe in would reveal that 
through that prophet and actually reveal that as doctrine or not. Right. And some of the other concerns that people have oftentimes is that one prophet will say one thing and the next prophet within, it could be a couple months after the previous prophet passes away is going on a completely different idea. Like for example, with President Monson, the church or the prophet before the current prophet, there was this big Mormon campaign. It was, I'm proud to be a Mormon, you know, and it was very common to call yourself a Mormon. Yeah, hashtag. And, and then it was almost immediately after he had passed away that President Nelson came in and said, no, you know, like we do not, and put an end to all of that, right? So that's one of those things where if I have to be concerned about that, because if God was allowing one prophet to have this long campaign for years and years, you know, why, if it wasn't okay so quickly after, why wouldn't the Lord have revealed to the prophet before the current one that, hey, you know, maybe let's not do that? Even if it was a, a, a mistake that he made as a man, not but, as a prophet, maybe there would have been some kind of revelation that we should put an end to that long before it went on for all of this time to, to build up this, this pride within the uh, church that I'm a Mormon and I'm proud of it. Yeah, and I would say neither of those were done under saying like, oh, they're just a man. You know, that's, you're giving a good example of both of those were campaigns throughout the church, definitely considered revelation and obviously very much prayed over to be able to do the campaign in the first place and right. then considered revelation um, in general conference over the pulpit being denounced it. So not all of the icky history you can write off as just a man, um, although I understand Brock's oh, yeah. hesitation in trying to say that it's not anything more than that, but just right. some thoughts on that. Right. And just one last thing to point out as well is I was told in the LDS church multiple times that what the current prophets are saying is now modern day scripture. Yes. 100%. If it's if it's scripture, you should be able to read it, you know, and and take it as this is directly from God, I would think. Oh yeah, after general conference talks, they send out um, the ensign and they have like all the general conference talks and you're encouraged to like go back and reread and re-listen to the latest general conference talks where the prophet's speaking and study that along with your scriptures because of how important it is that whatever the latest prophet said is, you know, new words from God. Like you right. said, it's a connection, you know, straight from God to his disciples. So. Right. I do want to point out as well, like for those that are like, well, if people found out about the icky history and it is doctrinal, then why wouldn't people leave from that? There's also the acceptance of the fact that the most current revelations trumps everything else in the past. And the idea of that modern revelation being the most important and that God can continually change his mind with society and continually um, work in that way is something that you basically just have to accept as a member of of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it's when you no longer, that if you can no longer accept that and you have a problem with things changing with the modern prophet is gonna come a, a really big test of your faith. But that's how people are able to stay in. If you believe that whatever the most pro modern prophet says is what God wants, then it doesn't matter what gets changed. Yeah. Or point. the history, right. really. Right. Non-Mormons like myself, I always thought to call you guys Mormons. Oh, and yeah. in doing research, some people said, don't say Mormons, say LDS. Oh. Other people <laughs> said, say Mormons. Go. What is it? What am I missing? Let's see what, what Brock says. Learn? So obviously the nickname Mormons comes from um, a volume of scripture we have called the Book of Mormon. Sure. And it was a nickname given to people who were actually antagonistic towards the church. Um, and but that was a very long they time ago. They called us Mormons as mm -hmm. kind of like a joke, like, oh, you don't believe in the Bible, you believe in this other book of Mormon when we believe okay. in we believe in all the, the modern scripture. Our current prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, he, in one of his first um, talks as um, prophet of the church, he gave a, a message where he said, basically, people are misunderstanding that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, when you hear just Mormon, you don't think Christian. You don't think of a church that could be... Um, seen as the Lord's restored I, I church. Do. I think Christian. That, that's good, but I mean, I think a lot of people think Mormon is, is its own thing. Okay. Mormonism is kind of its own bubble, when in okay. reality, our most fundamental belief is that we're just the restored version of Christ's church. And so by emphasizing 
the full name of the church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Obviously, that's a mouthful. It's a long name. <laughs> but yep. using that full name, it emphasizes that we believe we are the Church of Jesus Christ, literally, and that Latter-day Saint is the description of the people who are striving okay. to live so God's So if teachings. I call you Mormon, is that okay? Yeah, you can you can say that and people would know what you're His talking about. His hesitation. <laughs> you ah. hesitated. You hesitated. Um, <laughs> we'll let him finish whatever he's going to say, yeah. but the hesitation is real. That says it all. Talking about, but if I were... But does that insult you? It doesn't insult me, but it would, with current teachings from our prophet, he encourages us to say, oh, actually, you know, I love the prophet Mormon in the Book of Mormon, but in reality, we're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. So he very nicely said that we are encouraged to correct people. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which it, they are. Like they're encouraged to say, oh, actually, we prefer to go by this right. now. And we've heard that. I mean, we've been, I don't want to say rebuked, but we, <laughs> we've had some people unhappy with us for even calling the church LDS. Yes, instead right? of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day right. Saints. Although that is such a mouthful. But the reason why, okay... This one's a tough one for me personally, because when President Nelson did come out, this was one of the things that was hard for me in my faith transition. It was hard for me to trust President Nelson as a prophet. And ultimately, I ended up not believing that he was a prophet of God. And this was kind of one of those things that um, because the prophets that I grew up in love still to this day of Gordon B. Hinckley and Thomas S. Monson, um, they both taught me so frequently, even over the pulpit in general conference, to be so proud to be called a Mormon, that I was right. supposed to be proud, that I was supposed to share with the world that I was a Mormon, that I was supposed to shine that light, and just how proud I was supposed to be. And so when I was raised for the first 27 years of my life to be so proud to be called Mormon, and then the newest prophet came in and said, no, now I need to tell people, not only am I supposed to not say it myself, but I'm supposed to politely correct people mm -hmm. and tell them that I am no longer a Mormon. It made me feel like I was somehow supposed to be ashamed of that word now all of a sudden, and it didn't sit right with me personally. So I don't ever say Mormon out of, out of disrespect. To me, it's holding true to the values that I held my whole life and being raised in the LDS Church. Yeah. And yeah, something to remember is that, yes, the word Mormon or referring to the Mormon church as the Mormon church probably did come years and years ago from someone that was against the church, but the name stuck and people accepted that. And, that, and that's why they just accepted the fact that, you know what, the world knows this is the Mormon church, therefore be proud of it. Stand up and say, you know what, yes, I am a part of this great church. And so that's why for so many people, it was tough to switch that name. Well, and I felt like growing up too, if, if you said you were Mormon too, then people would ask you about the Book of Mormon or be like, oh, does that come from this? And then you'd get to share it. You know, Church of Jesus Christ, well, there's lots of churches that have the name Jesus Christ in it. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't make you stand out. And I was always taught my entire life that our goal was to stand out, to be a peculiar people, people to be able to try to show the differences we had and to separate ourselves from all the other Christian churches. Yeah. Not that we weren't Christian, but to show that we had something more than all the other Christian churches did. Right. And so this new movement, not only saying the name as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and getting rid of the word Mormon. I mean, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir was known as that worldwide, and they what changed that. What do they that. call it now? The Tabernacle Choir. They took oh, out the word Mormon. They took out the Mormon. See, and that's a, that's a big one right there. The yeah. Mormon tab Tabernacle Choir was known throughout the world for that. as the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And now and it's just, the Tabernacle Choir. Right. So. But aside from that, just the idea of trying to just make it sound more like a Christ, just a regular Christian church. Um, recently, the church changed on Google Maps. Instead of showing like a little angel Moroni and I bear where the churches are, they're all crosses. And I grew up that we're very much against showing crosses as any symbolism associated with our church. So President Nelson is definitely shifting to trying to make the church seem more like a Christian church, right. more like the other Christian churches than the way that I grew up with us trying to stand out and stand apart from those Christian churches and say, we have the fullness that the other Christian churches don't have, and that makes us special. Right. And we're not saying it's... What, he's, what they're doing is probably ultimately a good thing. We're not saying yeah. it's a bad thing. We're just saying that 
the change because it was so different and it, we and to be proud of the difference to then oh you know what let's try to blend in a little bit here can be that, hard for people that's where the the difficulty stands yes yeah i mean ultimately whatever the current prophet wants to do with the church is you know it's totally fine and up to them and mm -hmm. up to the members to accept that the second coming is a huge theme with lds right right exactly yeah but they've been talking about it since mid 19th century what are your thoughts on the second coming? So I, I, I personally, um, a lot of older members of the church really get excited about the idea. <laughs> I like to focus more on my relationship <laughs> with Christ now versus trying to say, okay, because there was an eclipse a couple of weeks ago, that means the second coming is right around the corner. So some of the older LDS members are thinking that? Yeah, they, they kind of get a hyper fixation on aspects of um, our doctrine that don't necessarily improve their life. It just it's something they like to, they call it kind of quote unquote like deep doctrine to try to look through the scriptures, find little hints of this will happen before the sun coming, this will happen. But if you listen to our current prophets, they're encouraging people to improve their lives spiritually. They're not necessarily saying, okay, go out and buy, you know, a giant bomb shelter and build it underground because the second coming is happening and this and that. Okay. <laughs> I have to laugh. I have to laugh. Not only does this sound like the FLDS, which the FLDS stayed true to a lot of the original teachings of the church. Or the deep doctrines. The when deep he's saying doctrines. deep doctrines, a lot of times when they say deep, it just means like deep in history, deep within LDS or Mormon doctrinal history. But in the defense of the old timers, <clears throat> we've been taught since the beginning of the church that these are the last days. Yeah, that the Joseph Savior. Smith said that. We need to we need to prepare. We need to be prepared now because the Savior is ready to come. He's he's ready and willing. And there was even one of the prophets, I don't remember if it was Gordon B. Hinckley, I want to say it was, that was weeping in his office one day, as the story goes, and someone asked him what was going on, and he said, the Savior's ready, but we're not ready to receive him. So you hear these things, that, this, that the things are happening now, we're in the last days. And so you have to understand from the viewpoint of the old timers, it's only in recent years that the, the leaders are starting to say things like, oh, no, we've got a long time to go. Don't worry about that. That is very recent. Very, very recent. I was raised very much we need to be prepared. Food storage, like when he's like, oh, yeah, bunker and food storage, like that was taught in church that we need to have a certain number of years of food storage. And they would even when we first got married, so we're talking 10 years ago, they were handing out like this is how much food storage you should have per person. And I was literally taking inventory in yeah. our uh, pantry to make sure that we had what the church told us to. And all of that isn't, it was all because of the horrible things that were going to happen and, and the second coming. It wasn't just, oh, okay, it's good to have. I mean, it slowly became, it's good to have extra. It's good to have some storage. But like Brock said, someone his age, though, is going to think, oh, food storage is just like in case you can't make your bills one month, you'll right. have something to eat. But that is not how it was when we grew up. It was 100%. We were the chosen generation. We were the last generation before Christ's coming. It was very much preached. So I think he's talking when he says old timers, he means us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder how old Brock is. Well, if he's in college, even if he served a mission... If he served a mission from 18 to 20, 20s, early 20s, four maybe. years of college, he's somewhere between 20 and 24, most yeah. likely. It's a different world nowadays, different church. Yeah, than what we were raised in. Yeah. But I read uh, that Mormons quite often have a year of food reservoirs <laughs> and money saved. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Just and in case, is that commonplace? That was, um, that was in the early 2000s from one of our prophets, President Hinckley. Yeah. Okay. Like I think said. a there lot of go. people interpreted that kind of direction or revelation as oh that means the second coming is right around the corner you got to have that prepared for the, that's what the we were told coming. but in 2008 we had this huge recession where a lot of people were out of work and this and that and so i kind of look at that as okay um protection just, during that time right just being prepared for whatever in case something happens well in hindsight it's 2020 though too so as a kid you're looking back and you're like oh that was said and then this happened so that must have been what he meant but it was very clear when gordon b hinckley was talking about it that it was for the second coming and more than just hard times right at least from 
everybody at that time, like I said, hindsight's twenty twenty. You can always look back and be like, oh, that was probably meant for this. There was probably meant for that. But in the moment when President Hinckley was saying that, everybody was thinking it was for the second coming. Right. And for all of the churches, I'm not saying that there is no re- revelation or inspiration out there, but I, but you have to admit that you see this throughout different religions, that the pre- preparedness and the preparing with food and different resources and things they always buckle down when times are hard on you know like if something a tragedy happens in the world all of a sudden it's very important that we make sure that we're prepared right Mm -hmm. and and i know that there are some families out there that have been prepared for 50 years now and they have always made sure that they have had had everything but a lot of people fall into the like brock saying here where where you know it's not like we're needing to fear that the end is coming you know maybe have a little bit of extra of this that and the other just in case there's a hard time but it seems like it's getting a lot more lax again whereas i wonder if something were to happen that maybe it would scare people into preparing once again once again a lot more and and fearing that maybe the end is near it's interesting now that we're not in utah hearing that the eclipse like scared some people into thinking that the end was near Mm. because we didn't hear that obviously in nevada but um it's also just this is such a side note but when it comes to food storage and stuff and i'm sure you had it as well but utah homes when we moved to nevada it is odd that there is not a room or like a either a very very large pantry with mm-hmm. enough room for storage or a completely separate room of the home that is considered a food storage room. Right. And in Utah, most custom homes, everybody builds a food storage room. So I had one growing up and I'm a t- huge room that had, well, not huge, but like, I don't know, a fairly large room that had just shelves and shelves and then just buckets of rice and beans and wheat and extra canned foods and stuff. But a lot of Utah homes it's just very, very common. Very common. Did you have a food storage room in your house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, <laughs> Sorry. So, the way I was raised in the FLDS, <laughs> the end was near always. And so we were very, we had a cellar, an actual cellar that was huge. I mean, this cellar was the size of some people's houses and that was just stacked to the ceiling with canned foods that we would can ourselves. And like you said, wheat and rice and everything, honeys and molasses. I mean, we were ready to go always. That's just the way it was out there. And I even to this day wonder after my family was forced out of their home with all of the late stuff that's going on with Warren Jeffs, what happened to all of that stuff? Yeah. You know, or if they ended up using it over the years. But we always had a very large supply. A lot of non-Mormons, including myself until recently, until I started researching LDS, would think a lot of Mormons are polygamous. (laughs) Yes, explain that to us. So yeah, um, our church has a history of practicing polygamy. And uh, it's something that Joseph Smith kind of introduced quietly when he was on the East Coast. And Uh then once the saints came to Utah and could practice freely, it was an open practice. And plural marriage was uh, a thing that was taught and encouraged, and people um, practiced it for a long time in our church. And then when Utah was in the process of becoming a state, um, people in the United States government was very unsure of polygamy and did not like that whole aspect of the church. And so after a while and lawsuits and stuff, the church was threatened to lose their property and their temples if they didn't stop practicing polygamy. And so the church stopped practicing polygamy um, back in the 1890s. And ever since we haven't, there are certain people within the church who believe that they shouldn't have stopped practicing polygamy. Um, and if they do believe that they're excommunicated, they're, you know, we do not have any tolerance for people who practice sure. polygamy. But there are what are called fundamentalist Latter-day Saints who um, have left the church and formed their own church where they still do practice polygamy. Their kind of like church headquarters um, okay. for a time was in Southern Utah. And that's Warren Jeffs, yeah. who's a common name. Um, and his brand of plural marriage is very different from the, the history of my church's practice of plural marriage. Plural marriage was still you dated people and came to that conclusion of deciding to get married together. Okay. It was not arranged marriages. And you can read hundreds upon hundreds of personal accounts from women and people who have practiced polygamy in our church history and come to that conclusion that they really felt that this was 
the right thing to do, where in the FLDS tradition and a lot of other fundamentalist traditions, the prophet has, decides who gets to marry who. Right. And it's all arranged marriages, which can get very messy quickly when you start marrying people who are below marriage age, which is something that Warren Jeffs got involved with. And uh, right. it and got so, very messy. And so Wow. Okay, and <clears throat> this is coming later. We will be meeting with, well, we already have, but the, the video will be coming out, us meeting with Peter and talking about all of the Warren Jeff stuff. But something to point out, though, is there's the Warren Jeffs, and then there's the FLDS. So the FLDS was a church for a very long time before Warren Jeffs came into power. And so there were, I mean, I hear people talking for, you know, before I was born, there was a lot of people that would meet uh, someone they wanted to marry, and then they would go and get approval from the church and get married within the church. But there was this dating or courtship, whatever you want to call it, even within the FLDS for a very long time. It wasn't really until the Jeffs took over, Rulin Jeffs, Warren's father, and then Warren, that everything was strictly arranged. Yeah, I did appreciate that Brock was very upfront about the history. Mm -hmm. um, yep. He did a great job explaining it, how it happened. Um, love that he acknowledged the fact that the state was getting a lot of pressure from the federal government because sometimes some people will try to, you know, say, oh, well, they just felt like it wasn't, you know, it was just revelation that randomly they were supposed to stop polygamy, but there really was a lot of pressure into how that happened. And so I thought that he did a great job explaining that process, really. And, and, and he actually admitted it, which, you know, a lot of members don't even acknowledge or admit that there ever was polygamy. Some of them try <laughs> to deny the fact that Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or any of the other early leaders of the church accepted it and practiced it. Yeah. So at least he acknowledges and admits that, you know, yes, this was a big part of church history. And I've talked about this before here, and uh, we'll, you'll hear us talk about it again in the future. But the FLDS Church, they, he, he kind of says it like, well, yeah, the, the government basically said we're going to take away your property if you, if you don't put an end to polygamy, and so we put an end to polygamy. Right? Like, okay, anyone that's very religious, it's not that simple. Like, if you believe in a doctrine, if you believe that something is coming from God, a commandment from God, you can't just say, oh, the government said no, so we said no, right? So that's where the FLDS came in, and that's where they started really, what they would say is that the mainstream LDS church fell away, and that mm -hmm. they continued the true doctrine and the true beliefs that were restored to the earth by Joseph Smith and those that followed him. So... It's a tricky situation. It's it's, uh, it's one church will say the other one is wrong, and the other one will say the other is wrong. But it's really it came down to faith in that moment. Yeah, and I mean, if the LDS Church had wanted to stop practicing polygamy, they could have been in a lot less um, danger in the Midwest or on mm -hmm. the East Coast, like long before that. If they had stopped practicing polygamy and some of these other controversial things that were going on within the Mormon Church, so them coming to Utah, a huge piece of that was to be able to practice polygamy. So ending yeah. it was definitely a very tough, big deal. Um, obviously, looking back, it's as easy as what Brock is saying right now, which is, like I said, a perfect description to say to someone like Peter that's asking that question. I think right. Brock did a great job. But there is a lot more, a lot, yeah. a lot to the church ending it and continued when he said earlier, like, you know, people will look back and they'll deep dive. There's a reason why so many people, when they deep dive and they look back at the fundamentals, not even talking about going to the FLDS, but just in general, when things change and current profits change things and people look back to the fundamentals, they almost always end up in polygamy. And that's why there's so many polygamous offshoots from the mainstream Mormon church, right. because they do go back and say, oh, well, this was restored, so we need to still practice it. And maybe they look back and they don't like the fact that the church changed because the federal government was coming and they say well god's law should be higher than you know the the government and so they go back to it so there's a lot of interesting aspects to the break off of polygamy but brock did a really good job right i think yep exactly so flds is under one percent of 
all Mormons. Yes, and we don't even... And you wouldn't even consider them Mormon, right? We, yeah, we, we... And they wouldn't consider you Mormon. Yeah, they, they, they <laughs> view our church as apostatized because yeah. we don't practice that. Yeah, they there you go. They also teach a lot of other fundamentalist documents or um, doctrines that are very, you know, we don't believe in at all anymore. Sure. And, Mostly uh, from Brigham Young. So it's, it, there's a huge distinction between us and fundamentalists. So is it that they believe they follow the original prophecy where your your prophecy evolves with every new president or prophet that comes into power. Exactly. Yeah. Is that so the difference? They they believe that, you know, they they're a huge fan of Brigham Young and all of his teachings. <laughs> yeah. They they're more likely to teach his prophecies and his doctrines that apply mostly to the 1800s and the time when the saints were in the pioneer settlements where now, you know, the beautiful thing about our church is we have a living prophet who can administer the church based on how the world is today and hold truth to truth or hold um, firmly to truth and mm -hmm. administer the church in that way okay. versus um, trying to, to teach how the church was back in the 1800s. Gotcha. Again, I think good description. Yeah. And I think the... There's controversy with what he just said. Yes, that's. What I'm like, are we going to address the controversy? We we have to admit that that uh, you know people will say, well, God is unchangeable. He doesn't change day to day. Just because our society or humans decide that you know they don't want to be certain a certain way, God restored the doctrine, the church, the way it was supposed to be, and so that's where you get the people from the other side, from the FLDS, and that saying, well, you know. God doesn't just change because the government doesn't like what they're doing. Yeah. So there's the controversy in there for sure. That's what I was going to say. And that goes with all the polygamous groups, not just the FLDS, right? But it comes down to whether or not when those early prophets said that this was doctrine, and that's where it gets tricky, right? Where people decide what is doctrine and what future doctrine is overrides the past doctrine mm -hmm. um, and that's where different beliefs come out of it right. and basically just deciding okay did they restore the fullness of the truth and that's what we're supposed to follow till the end of days like they kind of originally said it or is it an ever-changing ever-evolving the most current prophet and again that's what's when he said at the very beginning you know people try to invalidate beliefs really all of those beliefs are valid like you can take those yeah. and you can choose what you choose to believe is true and what you, who you choose to believe God is and how he interacts with his people. Right. And even Brock admitted that some he has interpreted certain things differently than other people have interpreted things that were taught over the pulpit from church leaders. So Absolutely. that alone, you know, if you're open to interpretation and personal revelation, where that leads one person might be completely different than another strong member of the church. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get some families that are very strong members of the FL or of the mainstream LDS slash Mormon church that very much disagree with what another family is doing. Yeah. And we would see that in Utah quite often where, you know, families didn't really agree with what other families were doing, even though they both believe very strongly in the current leader of the church. And that's just like every other church, right? Within every church, you have both sides of the coin. You have all sorts of different, um, it's a big spectrum. Right. So it's the right. same within the LDS church as well. And then up here, this is the Provo Temple. And this is where when you're at the MTC or you're at BYU, you'll come to this temple. Look and, familiar, uh, babe? Very much so. The, Been there many a time. And Moroni. On yeah, the top, right? there's the angel Moroni. He's one of the prophets in the Book of Mormon. And we put him at the top of our temples as a symbolism of like, he's calling people to the restored gospel and the gospel is being declared throughout the world. So do you have to be Mormon to go to school here? You don't. Some of our athletes come here for other reasons other than religious values. <laughs> Pretty much only athletes. We pay more on tuition <laughs> just because tuition yeah. is subsidized by tithing. And so that's okay. kind of a way of rewarding them. How much is tuition for you? So right now, winter of 2024, I'll pay 3300 for a semester. And then housing is probably about 300 a month and you share it with them. Um, oh, that's with great. So with oh, how highly ranked cheap. BYU's educational programs mm -hmm. are, it is an absolute steal compared yeah. to other private Christian colleges like TCU, Liberty University. You're paying $40,000 for a semester where you're paying $40,000 for all four years. 
this goes back to he mentioned it quickly but earlier when we were talking about tithing a huge portion of tithing goes to subsidize education mm -hmm. church education if you go to byu um and then to be able to go to byu like he said really only the people that go there that aren't members of the church are athletes because right. we basically can't make up sports teams of just lds members but even those people, they do have to have ecclesiastical endorsement. So they do have to belong to some type of faith and get that endorsement in order to be able to go. And then they still have to sign the same honor code. Right, and abide by the rules. And abide by the rules. So BYU I've heard that the honor, honor code, code has changed over the years, though. Have you heard that, too? Yes, it has. I'm, I'm going to leave it. They might talk about it. I'm not okay. sure because um, that could be a whole video on its own. But right. there's just rules that they have to follow church guidelines. Of your right. education here totally different vibe than Salt Lake City. Yeah, people call Provo and the suburbs the bubble because everything that happens within Utah is just so serene. It kind of feels like um, the movie, The Truman Show. I don't know if you've yeah, heard of that. The Truman Where everybody Show. seems Great like movie. they're so fake and put in a purpose to make everything feel so surreal and you know pristine. But everybody here is just living their life and doing their best to live Latter-day Saint teachings. And in direct result, you have a beautiful place where there's great values. and. Uh, people are improving the world and building the kingdom of God, so. Okay, so one of the best language schools in the country, is that true? Is that what we're looking at? Yeah, so this is this is the Missionary Training Center. This is where, um, before you begin your service as a missionary, you come here, you report here, and English missionaries as well as language missionaries, and you spend about three weeks if you're an English missionary learning teaching techniques, but if you're learning a language, you spend about six to nine weeks learning a language before you're um, you fly out to a, a new place. Yep, I spent about six weeks there before I flew out to Chile preparing for my mission. And uh, it's fun because you learn some of the like conjugations and whatnot when it comes to a new language. But I tell you what, g learning from someone there that maybe served a mission and learned the language from a different country than the one that I was going to, which was Chile. I showed up in Chile and I didn't understand anything they were saying. It was so different. <laughs> so it's it definitely gives you a good base, but when you get to the actual, at least for me, when I got to the actual country, it was, I, I basically went back down to zero and just had to figure out what they were saying because it sounded so different. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I definitely... I would say helps you kind of get started to, to then be able to learn a new language. Gives you some basics. Yeah. Hmm. This is kind of the self exit. This is where the missionaries will come. They get on buses here and they head to the airport. And this is kind of the, the exit from the MTC where, oh, you got a fan over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but this is where missionaries leave and they, uh, they take off, so. Wow. Yeah. And then it's two years you're gone. Two years you're gone, yeah. And you're not coming home for vacation or anything during yeah. that time. Two you, years you're gone. You're two years you're gone, and uh, you email back and forth to your parents. You call on your day off. You you know do video calls and stuff, but it's... That's, that's changed. changed. Yes, <laughs> when I was on my mission, it was, it was writing once a week home to your family by email is how we did it. And then it was for Mother's Day and Christmas that we were allowed to call home and have a, an actual voice conversation over the phone. Uh, nowadays, that's very different. I believe they can call home every week, right? Every week on yeah. their days off. Yeah, which right. is crazy. Like when that changed, I remember family members, one person, their son was about to go out on a mission and we're like, hey, this policy just changed. Does that make you so excited? And the parents were like, actually we've decided to not do that because that's going to be a distraction because that's what we were always told we were told right. if they called every week it would be a distraction it would yep. keep them from serving and focusing and i don't think they lasted very long before they were like hey no this is awesome no, we're just gonna call every week yeah, yeah. we're gonna call every week because it yeah. really helped the missionaries be able to cope because it's very very hard to be completely yeah. split off from your family for two and years to feel that to feel that support from your loved ones at home is very important and i'm not saying that it was extremely tough for me because I did try to just focus so much on the work. That's what I was told is if you, the more you focus on the work you're doing, the less you will miss being home. And so I just tried to focus, 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 focus. And that did kind of just get me through it and not think too much about, you know, home other than the yeah. few times a year I would get to call or a couple times a year. So, yeah. but yeah, I would definitely, I agree. Just going back a little bit here with Brock, 
definitely helped me be pull me out of my shell. One thing the mission taught me as well that I will forever be grateful for is just humility. Mm -hmm. Like, sorry, buddy, you don't know everything in this world. There are five-year-olds over here speaking a hundred times better than you are in this language (laughs) and laughing at you when you try to say something. So it quickly taught me humility and helped me realize that, you know what? It doesn't matter if I don't know everything right now. I can learn it. I can figure it out. I can put in the work and we can do this, right? So it was very, very good for me. Yeah. And this change into the video calls was about, what, five years ago? Has it been that long already? I think so. Yeah, man, time he's flies. Been home from his mission. Yeah. yeah, about five years. About five years now. So excited and happy for all these missionaries yes, who get to talk yes. to their families more often. But yeah, here's some people walking back to freshman housing, like right down there from the temple. Do you have a girlfriend, bro? I do not have a girlfriend, no. <laughs> the stereotype is to get married right off the mission and this and that, and for whatever reason, I haven't found the person that that's, yeah. that's going to be, but I'm not, not looking for that, I guess. So. Most important decision you can make in your life. It is, yeah, and I, I take that very seriously. We even believe that marriage carries on. You know, we say it goes on into the eternity, so it's not something that we just want to take lightly, and I'm trying to take it seriously. So, What are divorce rates like in the church, do you know? I just want to point out really quick, he he mentions he's trying to take it seriously. Uh, You know, he's probably making sure he says that in case his mission president sees this video. (laughs) Uh, When you are coming to the end of your mission, wherever it is you serve, generally speaking, or at least this was the case when I served, the mission president would make it a very, very high priority on the top of your list when you get home. The next thing you need to be doing, top priority, is finding your eternal companion, the person that you will marry. And so they put it as a very high priority, and they, at least they used to, always instill that in every missionary that was coming to the end of their mission to make sure that was a priority. Yeah, it's like that's the next step, you know, be worthy to go on a mission, go on a mission, come back, and the next step in priority is marriage. And that's why so many at BYU, so many people are getting married and having kids while still trying to get their degree. Yep. Yeah. Very low. Um, It's very rare because of that dynamic of marriage being kind of like the crowning ordinance in the faith i don't know what the exact number is but it is definitely a lot lower than the statistics of the united states so i wonder if that's true i know it used to be i haven't looked recently i know it used to be that way but uh you know it's the when someone gets married in the mormon or lds temples they are making a covenant with the or a commitment with the person they are to marry but also with god right so you're gonna look it up Mm -hmm. awesome uh so they they feel that it's very important that they stick it out because they had made this commitment with not only their companion but also with god okay let's see so this article um love to know.com but it was updated June 20th of 2023. So something more recent says that American divorce rate for Mormons is 9%. So, so definitely if that's lower. true, that's significantly less. Significantly less. Interesting. And to be a practicing Mormon, do you have to go on a mission? You do not. It's for, for males that is very much encouraged. It's, uh-huh. it's called a, a priesthood responsibility. Mm. Um, but for, for sisters, it's... Um, they they can choose to go and the age for be for serving as a sister missionary was moved to 19 a couple years ago and ever since it's like a huge uptick in um in sister missionaries compared to so they're way yeah i was gonna say that definitely made a huge difference because it used to be 19 for the men 21 for the women that's how it was when i was in my early 20s and that was way harder for girls because you'd be like three years into your education or, you know, you graduate high school and you'd be either right in the middle of your degree. You'd be right in the middle of, um, I mean, possibly there were a lot of girls by 21 were married in Utah already, but, um, right in the middle of jobs, careers. I know when I was thinking about whether or not I was going to serve a mission, you know, I had a good career and I just bought a home. And so there's, it, it was much harder. And so now they're moving it to 19 years old for girls it's a lot. I feel like if it had been 19 when I was 19, I think I would have gone. You think you would have? Uh huh. I'm okay. pretty sure because I would have graduated high school and I would have only had like an eight month gap. And I would have spent that time considering like just 
okay, I'm just preparing for my mission. And that's what a lot of young girls do now. I wonder how different your life would have been had you served a mission, you know? It's just, <laughs> yeah, who you, knows, You never right? know. But there's those things that, those things that would have changed so much had you done something different, you know? I, or you could have gone and possibly become a professional tennis player instead of, instead of working, you know? There's so many things. So many things. But I'm glad it worked out the way it did. Me too, me too. I even <laughs> wonder, even at 21, like I remember praying about whether or not I should serve a mission. And I remember thinking like, maybe I'm going to get the answer that I need to sell my home. I need to give up my career and I need to give up everything to do this. And I felt like I prayed about it a lot and I felt the answer that I wasn't supposed to go. And I felt like it was my first like fight with God almost. Like I was kind of, you thought you were, I was frustrated. I thought like, the answer would be yes. I thought for sure the answer was going to be yes. And I felt mm. very, very strongly and very firmly that I wasn't supposed to go. And I was actually pretty upset by it. See, I didn't, I didn't need an answer from God because I had uh, Elder Holland tell me that I should go. So, the, you know, one of, one of the apostles of the church yeah. said, so I'm like, all right, we're good to go. Yeah, if I had had that, I was uh, with a uh, personal revelation. <laughs> yeah. but... Hey, more male missionaries than sister missionaries. Yeah. But that's changing. It is changing. I mean, that's yeah. upticking. It is very common. So. so here's my question with proselytizing or converting people to a religion. Yeah. Like if a Muslim person came here and talked about Islam, mm -hmm. they have 0% chance that they're going to convert you. Yeah. Right? So when you go to someone else, when they're practicing a religion, it's a tough sell, isn't it? Like, it is, yeah. It's a like good is any, question. What's the conversion rate? So, I mean, I don't have any, like, set numbers of, sure. like, how many doors knocked, how many people. Right. Um, That'd is, be a tough one to get. But, but it, it is, you know, there is kind of a trade-off there of, like, hey, we're asking people to do something that's um, very difficult to, to change beliefs. And there, there are a lot of people who are Christian, send Christian uh -huh. belief systems, a Muslim uh -huh. belief, any, any religion, but they're not necessarily super active in it. Okay. Um, yeah. Or they're that looking, like or they grew up in the church of some other church and they feel like they're missing something. And that's a very common. Okay. And then, I've had, you know, he, he mentions this. This is a great question from Peter. And because it's true, if like he's asking Brock, you so f strongly and firmly believe in your religion, you know, if someone came from any other religious background and tried to convert you, the answer would be no. And that's something that missionaries have to remember is that, you know, these people, a, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of people that they're trying to convert believe just as strongly as they do mm -hmm. in their belief in religion. It, it's generally generally those that were possibly born into a Catholic belief or something, but aren't really going to church. They just kind of have the basics, at least on my true. experience uh, in in South American countries and that those are the ones that are willing to look into it because they already believe in Jesus Christ. And so talking more about his teachings and adding little things here and there, sometimes it's a little bit of an easier, I don't know if I want to say sell, but, but other people I tried to teach, actually tried to flip it on me and teach me and try to convert me into their belief when I was on a mission. <laughs> so there's definitely a lot of, of that where people say, no, I'm not interested in believing in what you have to sell, but you want to listen to my message? So you, you see a lot of different things out there. Mm -hmm. and, the and, you're, come, and you guys are offering it. Yeah, and the okay. missionaries come by and they say, hey, we have this thing called the plan of salvation. It, you know, clicks some gears and like, oh, that sounds okay. interesting. Or, oh, we believe that Christ church needs to be restored on the earth again. They're like, oh, that sounds interesting. I want to listen. So these little questions we talk about might resonate with someone and they can add on to their faith. And Gotcha. So a lot of people reached out to me in my audience Mm -hmm. I got all sorts of responses actually when I said I was doing this series. Yeah. Many positive, many have been asking for this for a while actually. Non Mormons curious about it. But some reach out and say, it's a cult, it's a full on cult, X, Y, and Z. Don't do it, don't expose them. What, what are your thoughts to this? And that's not an easy question. Take it any way you want. That's a, it's a very difficult question because it comes from a place of people have a very, um, people have a very large definition of what a cult is. And technically, if you look on like Google and you type in what is a cult, it's like an organization that follows a spiritual leader and everybody like adheres to something. And it's kind of okay. like a very basic thing. And technically we fit that, um, we fit that because 
we believe in Jesus Christ and we follow him and everybody strictly follows, you know, a religious figure. Yes, I think when people, and again, we don't refer to the LDS church as a cult, we consider it a high demand religion. But I think when people are referring to the LDS as a cult, they're not talking about having the religious figure be Jesus Christ right, and adhering to exactly. him. They're talking about it, there being a prophet, a man who speaks for God to them mm -hmm. and adhering to what the prophet says. Exactly. So I just want to clarify Those that. were the same thoughts I had when he, when he said that we f follow a certain teaching, I thought prophet, not Jesus Christ. But I'm not saying they don't follow Jesus Christ's teachings. It's more about the leader of the church living today that they are following his teachings is where people get the idea from, yes. And I think too, you know, cult obviously has a very negative connotation. I think a lot of times within um, other things that people see as cults, anytime one specific man is saying that he speaks for or to God himself, mm -hmm. um, that, causes alarms for a lot of people. Obviously, if you're raised in it, it doesn't. Like like Brock said, um, for me growing up, it made perfect sense. Like God's not just gonna give us the Bible and never speak to us again. Right. He had prophets before, he has prophets now. But I think a lot of people in other Christian faiths where what they have is only Jesus, the idea of also having this one man speak to God for an entire group of people comes off as scary in some way. Uh, and I think people throw the, the word cult around a lot more nowadays than they used to. Uh, yeah. It's a lot less likely for someone to believe someone that claims they're talking with God, right? That's just kind of the way that things are changing. And so it's it's definitely becoming a lot more common that people say, oh, he claims he talks with God, cult, 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 cult. Yeah, they're you more know? skeptical of spiritual yeah. things, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Um, but then if you were to say that we trap people in the religion, you're not allowed to leave, you know, you're locked in, you see a lot of the very um, hard abuse scandals you see in other cults and stuff, you don't have that in the church. If you wanted to leave, you can leave. You're going to have pressure of people, of people trying to convince you to stay, but it's not like if you just say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, if, well, if I were to say, tell my bishop or anybody who, you know, is a church leader over me, I'm, I'm feeling about leave, feeling like I'm going to leave the church. Yeah. They're not going to arrest me and put me in a cage and, you know, <laughs> say, actually, your family is not allowed to talk to you anymore. Or any of these scary tactics that you see other um, religions employ that would be considered cults as well. You don't see that in the church. It's not like, I think that's a tactic of maybe Scientology where you're, okay. or maybe Jehovah's Witnesses where you're, you're not allowed to talk to them anymore. That's... Um, not the case. Okay. FLDS. Sometimes people won't want to talk to people who've left the church and they're bitter because no one feels comfortable having their talking to somebody who's constantly deriding their beliefs and stuff. But there's okay. no church doctrine that says, okay, once someone's out, you can't talk to them anymore and sorry, the family's okay. broken up. That's yeah, I was going to say, I think within the LDS church, and I think members in general are becoming much more progressive and much more open to people who are leaving the church. And as it becomes more common, like as more people are leaving the church, church members are also learning how to handle that more yeah. appropriately. Because for a while, and like when I was younger, it was very common that it wasn't the church leaders told you you couldn't talk to them, but um, people were like more shunned and it was more of a social shunning. Like, well, if you're not, if you're choosing to not believe the same things we believe and be at church with us, then, well, we don't really want your bad influences around, you know? And that's something I was taught as a young girl. I was like, I could be friends with everybody, but you also had to be very careful. Like the church taught more of like, you have to be very careful about the influences around you. So if somebody's right. leaving the church, they could be a bad influence on you. And so you'd kind of avoid them more or make sure that you're not in certain situations or I don't know. So I feel like that's going away though. Yeah, I agree. Especially though, if the person that is leaving the church is found in a way speaking up against the church, or as the members would call fighting against the church, then it is, it almost seems like a, the rule of thumb, you just don't associate with that person yeah. if they're fighting against the church. Well, and as he said, you're like, um, Brock just barely said too, like if and it makes some people uncomfortable, especially right. if they're talking against it, right? If they're going to openly like, the, it's going to make members of the church feel really uncomfortable if somebody leaves the church and then mm -hmm. they're like trying to drink a beer around you. Right. Well, that's going to make everybody else that doesn't drink beer very uncomfortable. And, and there's just and the point there's of, there's just a point of disrespect as well that some people just don't, I don't know. It's almost like they're intentionally trying to make them feel uncomfortable, trying to prove a point when they know perfectly well that it's going to make them feel uncomfortable because they 
two once believed in the same thing. So those are the things when it's both of us, we get frustrated when people try to shove something down another person's throat when they know that it's going to make them feel very uncomfortable. But some people are just like that. I think a lot of times um, in the FLDS, within the LDS, in any type of ha- high demand religion, if you are on one pendulum or one side of the pendulum, right, and you have extreme and all these rules, and then when they leave, they end up like swinging clear over here to where like, okay, I don't want any rules and I want to be able to do whatever I want, da, 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 and not realize that like most of society, people who are not religious at all, people like Peter, they're just right here in the middle, like mm-hmm. living good lives happy not offending people not being like that at all and it's hard for people to find like that medium ground because maybe they haven't seen that in their lives you know when people leave the flds they go from this is all the truth and if i'm leaving that i'm going to hell anyway so i might as well just swing all the way over here and do whatever i want all the time and not realize that the majority of people are here in the middle just living good lives yeah so it can be yeah it's more of a, a social shunning but like i said i think overall members of the church are getting much better at that oh yes i I agree and just to be clear if we weren't clear before about it coffee is a no-no but if the current prophet or the next prophet whomever Mm -hmm. says coffee's okay then coffee's okay yeah and so i don't see that ever Mm -hmm. happening i can totally i can see it happening i can totally in the near future actually yeah, because even things like on BYU's campus, they didn't allow caffeine for a while because when Gordon B. Hinckley was the prophet, there was a lot of people, I can't remember what exactly was said, but there was a lot of people who interpreted the reason why we couldn't have coffee or tea was because of the caffeine. So there were a lot of households that I know of families who stopped drinking any caffeine. They wouldn't drink caffeinated Coke, Pepsi, nothing like that. Um, and then they were like, no, that's not doctrinal. So it kind of went away. But BYU campus had for a very long time no caffeine was on BYU campus and people were like if it's not doctrinal and there's no reason why we can't have caffeine then why is it not on like the church's right. campus and I believe they got rid of that well they did and I think one of the reasons why is I believe it was an apostle or it was either an apostle or one of the 70s someone really high up in the church made the comment that I don't know where people got this no caffeine idea I very much enjoy my diet coke or my coke uh, you know, and so I think when he said that, a lot of people, oh, oh, a lot of people changed their ideas and maybe even BYU at that point did. And they fought for, like, basically the campus had to, the students had to fight for being able to have caffeine on the campus. Yeah, yeah. But my point is, things like that change, like the cultural things change. And um, it's very, it would be very, very easy to go back to like allowing coffee because the word of wisdom itself in the scriptural reference, it does say the very first verse says, this is not meant to be a commandment. Then the prophets did change it into a commandment for temple worthiness, but it would be so easy for them to change it again and say, you know what? It's totally fine to have coffee. It was never meant to be be a commandment. It is no longer a commandment. I can totally see this one. And we already know a lot of current active members of the church that interpret their thing the way they want to and they drink coffee and when they go for their temple recommend and they ask are you living the word of wisdom they say yes because they feel like they are so mm-hmm. some people already are don't feel it. don't feel like they have to not drink coffee in order to be worthy so because you know, they're interpreting the scripture the scripture right. literally instead of and i feel like that's more common for those living outside of utah yeah. Because those living inside of Utah, it's still very cultural to look down upon drinking coffee. Yes, it's much better to go to Swig, which is delicious. By the way. <laughs> it is, um, because that's kind of a huge part of um, faith in the church is sometimes doing things that don't necessarily make sense. Okay. And so getting rid of that and just saying, oh yeah, there really isn't evidence that coffee is bad. It would um, not require as much faith on the, on behalf of the members. Oh, we'll see, Mr. Brock. We'll see. That makes me sad. Like, hey, the whole point is to not have to actually have things make sense because you have to prove your faith. Mm. Those are the type of things that make people question where the line between high demand religion is, right? Right. Because if it's not for the betterment, if there is no actual reason and no spiritual reason other than just listen to me because I said so, that's when you start getting into like that scary territory, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You just have to blindly follow that. That can be where some of the what people consider cults fall into the bad things that can happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, but soda at one time was not allowed. Now it's allowed. 
Yeah, well, it, I don't know if there was ever like a point where probably in conference talks that or say, caffeine, right? Yeah, so so people used to <laughs> so what we're talking about. the reason we can't drink coffee is because of caffeine. <laughs> and so obviously lots of sodas have caffeine. So people would drink sodas just not with caffeine and BYU, the MTC, they'd have drink machines, but it would all be <laughs> just Coca-Cola with that gold logo with no, caffeine free. Um, oh, okay. So that's how you could do it. Yeah. Let's let's go. Let's check it out. Now in 2015, BYU now has caffeinated beverages. Woo -woo. And I think when BYU did it, a lot of members said that's okay. And so then we start to see places like this where people come to get their caffeinated beverages in the form of a soft drink. I thought you guys ate well. Yeah, I mean, the word of wisdom, that's what it's intended for. But then sometimes you get like kind of the opposite and you have a place like this. I'm, so. just, I'm just teasing you, Brock. It's just, it's funny. I know that Peter's just being funny here, but it's, it's a good point he brings up because I knew a lot of people that say, I don't drink coffee because I'm following the word of wisdom, which is supposed <laughs> to be good for my body. And so instead of having a cup of, of coffee to get their caffeine, they drink multiple cups of Diet Coke to get their <laughs> caffeine. And or monsters, monsters, or, everything. Well, yeah, yeah. So it's like, eh, so anyway, it's a fun joke, but Peter has a good point here. Okay, so garments. What, what were you saying about clothing? You can tell when someone is LDS because because they'll they'll be wearing um, what we call temple garments. So most religions have um, outward appearances of religious clothing that they'll wear over their clothes. Um, but for Latter Day Saints, we wear uh, once we've gone through the temple, we we wear temple garments under our clothes, and it's a very sacred aspect of our belief and because of the way this clothing is designed if you're wearing like a very sheer white shirt like for men for business attire you can okay. see kind of the scoop neck of the um of the garments so you're wearing temple garments right I now? i am right now yeah so what I'm, what are they white or yeah so they're they're white it's an inward commitment of our commitment to follow jesus christ and it's kind of a constant reminder of our um, promises we've made in the temple so just a shirt or underwear or everything? Yeah, it's it's very similar to the style of an undershirt you see um, okay. men wearing and then just boxers um, that you see. Yeah. And so every day of your life you're wearing temple garments? Yeah. The only time I, I, I take it off is um, for if I'm doing, like if I'm going for a run, I'd probably wear, um, I'd take them off because I wouldn't want to get them gross or sweaty. And Sleeping, you take them off? Sleeping, mm -hmm. I, I, I keep them on. Some people choose to, to take them off. Um, so it's kind of up to the person to... We were just, you know, we, we promised to wear them, and it's kind of up to the individual um, okay, how so much that means. Okay, so are to, most to people wearing them, do you think, in the church? Yeah, yes. if, if you've gone through, gone through the temple and you're an adult member of the church who's active, you, most likely they are wearing temple garments at, at any given time. All those missionaries or future missionaries we saw, they're wearing temple garments. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, we believe there's um, not necessarily like physical protection, like it's not like it's a bulletproof vest or anything, but we do believe that wearing it, um, we will be pr protected against the power of um, the adversary. I was taught growing up that it was a physical protection too. And there are lots and lots of stories in church all the time. People tell about. About people talking about the physical protection that it gave, like that it would literally like not cut or wouldn't burn or there's all sorts right. of stories like that yeah did you ever hear any of those oh yes and on my mission i would have other missionaries tell me about stories all the time that you know they were f freezing cold but their garments kept them warm so they didn't get sick or die or something and you'd hear all sorts of different stories and um, and just to also kind of add here brock might mention this but nowadays they're becoming a lot more like he said like like a traditional undershirt would look like they're becoming more normal looking i guess you could say yeah whereas they used to be a one piece now it's just like an undershirt with like similar to boxers yeah okay. and it's a reminder to um, keep our promises with god and to keep the name of jesus christ with us at all times okay so only super conservative mormons are wearing very traditional clothes correct on the outside yes yeah that's um fundamentalist groups i'm not sure necessarily what they're grasping onto to wear like those prairie dresses you so see. only fundamentalist groups which is under one percent of 
everyone. Yeah. In the and that's not all fundamentalist groups. A lot of the fundamentalist groups do wear the same clothes that the mainstream LDS church wear. Or like, regular society. Like the Kingstons or the uh, AUB, those up in northern Utah, they wear the normal clothes. Whereas yeah. it's the FLDS church that have the traditional prairie dresses, long sleeve button up shirts for the man and, and long pants and all of that. And that was always, well, a couple of things because they wear, the, the reason they have to wear that is because they wear the traditional mm. style garments. garments. And those traditional style garments are a one piece garment that go to your ankle, up to your, almost your neck and down to your wrists. In order to cover those, you have to choose very modest, very much covering type of clothes. And the prairie dress thing for the FLDS got more extreme over time for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of went to like, they always had the long sleeves and the, and the long skirts in the FLDS, but the, the style you see now got more and more like that over time after the Jeffs took over, uh, the, the Rulin and Warren Jeffs. They turned it into this very pastel colors and very plain looking prairie dress look. Yeah. So what are non-Mormons not understanding about you guys? Like, what do we not get, let's say? I think it's just, um, for a long time, um, there hasn't been a lot of light shined on the church. And so when you hear these different things, like we don't drink coffee or we build temples again, um, like people did in the Bible, we send missionaries out, you hear all these ideas and it makes us sound so peculiar. In polygamy, people yeah, think you're polygamy. polygamous. Um, any of this, you know, Wild West history, <laughs> at the end of the day, we're just Americans trying to make the, the world a better place. And I fundamentally believe that members of the church who are also citizens of the United States have that special connection to the, to the country. And through their promises they've made in the, in the temple, they um, try to make beautiful places like we are, like we're seeing here. Yeah. And we're just like other Americans, even if we do don't drink the same things as them. I guess. Do you feel ostracized at all by the country or by the non-Mormons or now? Um, it depends on who you're talking to. If you if you know if you're talking to people who are very versed in our theology and don't agree with it, you do feel a little bit uncomfortable because they're okay. going to attack you for your beliefs. But for the most part, I feel like um, if most Americans could just understand that we're just people as well trying to make the world a better well, place, there would well be a lot more connection yeah. and we're similar to other Christians in, in the country. I would say overall, the Mormon belief is pretty well accepted as far as like, you know, a lot of people have LDS mem or neighbors friends. and friends and like, especially the places that we've lived, you know, there's just a, it's very well, even in Nevada, very well accepted, it seems like at least. Yeah, I never felt growing up like ostracized or, you know, people would ask a lot of questions mm -hmm. for sure, which made sense. Again, I was taught to be proud, to be peculiar and and I wanted people to ask questions so that I could share my faith. So right. um, I never thought of like people asking questions as any kind of the being mean or anything to me um, yeah. i don't think anyone had ever been mean to me and i had lots of opportunity because i traveled a lot and yeah i felt like overall people were very accepting if anything they were just curious even on my mission you know which was a completely different country you know that was and i was wearing my missionary attire all the time so i stood out and people generally knew who i was it seemed like I was pretty well accepted and at least to the point of no one was trying to, I don't know, talk down on me. They, they did have questions, like you said, but I was happy to answer, right? So it was, I think when you get someone that is so proud of their beliefs, that when someone asks a question and maybe they're hoping to trap you in something, and, and in my case, I was so proud, I would just... Oh, I'd love to talk to you about it. Yes, I love this. I Same. love that. And so it almost threw them off guard. And they were like, oh, maybe there's something to this, right? Because we were just so happy to share. So in a lot of cases, I feel like even if they were trying to come at us in a certain way, they left not really 
feeling or looking down on us. At least it seemed that way. Along those notes of wanting to share, you know, he mentioned, you know, the time that he might feel most like ostracized by people is people who have left that know a lot theologically Mm -hmm. about the Mormon church. And he said, then they can, you know, come off as attacking or making people uncomfortable within the church. And I just want to point out, because I had this realization, I don't know, within this last year that... When you've been raised LDS your whole life, and like you said, you're very proud and happy to share your knowledge. You want to share the truth, the whole truth, the truth that you have with the whole world. And your whole life, you've been taught to share it, share it, share it, share it, share it. That is very hard to turn off just because you leave the religion. Mm. So a lot of times, you know, and it does make, you know, full believing members feel uncomfortable when members who leave share all of the things that they believe to be true now because a lot of times it's against the church right and so it comes off as bashing it comes off as hurtful and you know not being sensitive to them but i just want to point out that sometimes it's because they've been taught their entire life to share what they believe to be true and when what they believe to be true now is that the church isn't true they're going to share that in the same way that a missionary shares with so much enthusiasm their belief Well, now someone who who no longer believes in the church might share with that same enthusiasm why they believe the church isn't true. And they want to convert people to that as much as an LDS missionary wants to convert to Mormonism. And so it's hard to see both sides. And I'm not saying it doesn't make uncomfortable and you definitely want to be respectful, but hopefully that can... I don't know, touch someone who might think, oh, okay, I didn't, I hadn't thought about it that way before. Right. No, it's a very good point, babe. Very good point. I think that people need to be respectful on both sides, that uh, just because someone is coming across attacking someone else's belief, in a lot of cases, you know, even if you're a strong believing member of the church, if you come across in a way that what you believe is the only truth and you must believe, that could also be attacking towards someone else's belief. So respect from both sides, I think, would go over very well. This is the Christus statue. The original's in Europe, but we've kind of made this our church a symbol of, you know, we believe we are the church of Jesus Christ. And this is on the right outside of our our temple here. Provo temple. this is temple. one of your favorites. Yeah. Yes, yeah, this is one of my favorites to go to just because it has kind of a mix of the pioneer aspect. Um, it used to be an old pioneer meeting place. Well, bro- it originally was the tabernacle. Yes. And then they renovated it after a fire into the temple. And it is absolutely gorgeous. We've been inside that temple. It is so, so beautiful and so different than a lot of other temples. Yeah, the architecture is just breathtaking. Hawk, I really appreciate it. You know, I've never had a conversation with a Mormon for this long. Yeah. And maybe I have. I just didn't know the person was Mormon. That's true, yeah. But I also want to say there's like a little bit of this line or barrier not really because i go in all different cultures but a little bit like is he going to look down on me a bit for not being mormon you know whenever you get into a religious group you know i as a non-religious person i i you know i'm always curious about that yeah and some who are very devout um to maybe a, an extreme level will always think anything other than them is less than and then there are people like you today who's very devout and strong in your beliefs but I felt was it was great hanging out with you, and well, uh, I appreciate it you was coming it out, was yeah. beautiful um, seeing it through your eyes and learning through you. I learned a lot today. I know the audience did too. And without people like you, it's not easy to get in. At least it hasn't been with a Mormon willing to give this tour, an LDS member uh, willing to give this tour, because I understand when cameras come out. I can twist this in any way I want. Yeah. And the power of the edit can do whatever you want. And then we can put it all under the bus. And that's not my intention. So thank you for giving the trust yeah. and for bringing us into your world. It's been super interesting. Well, I appreciate yeah. you coming out here and yeah. uh, willing to let my, let my experience shine through in this video. So thank you. Good stuff, Rock. Yeah. All right. All right, guys, thanks for that. It's the first of many Mormon videos. I have a few more. I'm going to Southern Utah in a few days. I'm gonna hit it from a few different angles. Love you to come along on that journey. Until the next one. Well, well, well. Brock was such a great representative. He's like, I feel like such a, like I said, great representative of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Super sweet guy. 
Um, very so says it how it is. Says it how it is. He was very open to some of problematic things. He didn't try to hide anything. It didn't, didn't try to shun away from some harder topics. So. I don't know. I felt like that was really great. Yeah. I would say great job to Peter, a great job to Brock. They both did a great job. I love the questions that Peter asked. And uh, I don't think there was one single question that Brock tried to avoid. You know, no, he, he just said it how it was. I was so proud and happy to hear him admit to, yes, the church practiced polygamy. Yes, the church did this, the church did that. Uh, it's when people tried to try to, uh, I don't know, claim that the church never did these things. That's when people start to speculate or start to wonder what's actually going on. Why, what are they hiding? Yeah. So I appreciated that he didn't try to hide anything. Yes, he did a great job. Super fun video. Again, we're going to react to all of these Mormon videos from Peter leading up to the one that we are in. So yes. stay tuned for those. And I know he has some other fundamentalist videos coming up as well. So we're looking forward to seeing what those people have to say. Yes. If you want to hear more about it, was like for Sam to grow up in polygamy or us react to more things like this that are just about Mormonism in general, then please like and subscribe. Yes. Thank you all so much for being with us once again. We look forward to talking with you soon. Talk to y'all soon.